Yes, I, I, I'm relieved to have uh, followed uh, Pia Michaela, who's, uh, first of all, because I'm a, a bit of a fan of her work here on, on uh, taxation changes in Finland and, 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 and mortality. It's pretty influential in some of the work we've done in, in Scotland. But I, I'm not an epidemiologist. I, I'm, a, I'm a clinician who, I suppose, has become a, an advocate and, and campaigner. So uh, I'm really going to be talking about the UK guidelines from the perspective of someone who um, was a little bit involved in, in, in in, in, in making submissions, but not in the detail of the guidelines. But I will be involved in communicating that both to the public and, you know, I would have been involved in my previous role as a clinician in communicating that to, to individuals. So uh, that's really the perspective that I'm, uh, I'm seeing this from. Uh, okay, so <coughs> um, a little bit of, 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 of history of our guidelines and probably at the very start, I should say that... Um, we, we, we do need some, some definitions and some common language as much as we can establish here. Um, so when I say a unit, I mean 10 mLs of alcohol or 8 grams of alcohol. Uh, and the UK guideline does say a little bit uh, about um, what they would like to see happen with, um, with, with the standardisation of our, of our language around this. You could probably guess what a UK guideline says, but I'll, uh, you, you can either confirm your... Uh, or refute your guess at the end. Um, <coughs> the first guidelines in the UK were produced by what was then called the Health Education Council, which, as the name suggests, was a, a UK health information body. And they came up with, with these guidelines in 1984 of a safe level of 180, gram, uh, 180 mLs, 18 units for men and, and 9 units for for, for women and too much as being this amount, 56 units, 560 mLs of, uh, of, of alcohol for men and 350 for women. So those were the, the, really the, the, the very first UK guidelines were um, getting on for about uh, uh, 30 years ago. Um, the UK Royal Medical Colleges then produced uh, updated work and this was the Royal College of Physicians, including gastroenterologists, uh, psychiatrists and general practitioners. Those were the three groups of, 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 of doctors who produced uh, these guidelines, which were based on a kind of um, their clinical wisdom, if you want to call it that, uh, and they came up with, 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 with these levels. Uh, in 1995, the UK government uh, changed the guidelines to between 20 to, to, to 40 ml, slightly lower for women than for men daily. They changed the guideline to, to a daily guideline. Um, and this was produced by a group of uh, government staff, of civil servants, uh, without any health professional involvement, though there were officials from the health department involved. There were also officials involved from the departments of trade and departments of agriculture. Um, and uh, the health professions didn't like these guidelines and, and the uh, guidelines from the Royal Colleges remained unchanged um, for, from the, the previous weekly guideline. So there was con some controversy in the mid-1990s that the government uh, th themselves had, uh, had altered the, 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 the guidelines without um, the consultation with professions. <coughs> in 2012, the UK Parliament, the London Parliament's uh, Science Committee called for a review of guidelines and uh, four years later, rather less than four years later, those guidelines emerged in, in January of this year. Um, and over those four years between the UK, the Parliament Science Committee calling for it uh, and the report coming out, as Pia said, there was a considerable amount of background work done which might seem rather a lot of work for something that the expert group the, on, on behavioural science uh, found little evidence regarding the impact of any guidelines on changing health behaviour. So four years' work for something that actually the expert group is not expecting to do very much. And that might be a, a, a point that we'll, uh, we'll come back to. The context of the parliamentary review in, in 2012. I think that science committee review came out because there was quite a lot of this kind of stuff. This is a, a news report from 2007 in the UK that the safe drinking guidelines were simply a guess. 
So the drinking guidelines that the medical royal colleges had developed in the in the in the mid 1980s uh, were described as, as as simply a guess, a bunch of doctors sitting around a table saying what they thought it, it ought to be, uh, and there was perhaps some some truth in that in that allegation. Um, and uh, some of us, myself included, expected that the science committee would probably come out and say, this is too complicated, there's too much variability, and we shouldn't have a guideline at all. So some of us thought that was a possibility. So in fact, when the science committee said that there had been significant new science, significant new development, and it really needed a, a good review, that was, uh, I'll confess, a little bit of a, a, a surprise to me. Uh, because that, that wasn't what uh, we were expecting. But it was a welcome, I think, uh, exercise to, to be undertaken. And so these guidelines came out in uh, January 2016. They're easy to find on the internet. I actually I sent them to, uh, to, to the team here, uh, so they should be easily available for anyone who wants to, to, to find them. <coughs> um, and perhaps another point I should just have made about the guidelines... You'll note that each of these were made by a different body. Okay, so the first group was the Health Education Council, the second group, the Medical Royal Colleges, third bunch of guidelines, the UK government, and, and our current guidelines are from the four United Kingdom chief medical officers. So that's from England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and, and Scotland, who are um, ad, ad, advisors to independent ad, advisors to the government on on health and medical issues. So. Our sequence of, of, of guidelines have all come out from different bodies, and that's uh, probably worth noting. So what do our guidelines actually say? And um, as I say, these are, these are, are, are freely available. So uh, I'll, I'll just draw attention to um, a couple of things. Is this a pointer as well? It does, OK. Um, so the guideline for both men and women, and I'll come back to that issue. You're safest not to drink more than 14 units a week to keep your risk of alcohol at a low level. OK, so... Um, Low risk level is the is the is is, is the key term here. Um, advice to to spread your your, your drinking um, evenly. That for some illnesses your risk increases with any amount that you drink on a regular basis, um, and for alcohol free days. The value of alcohol-free days is largely that it cuts down your overall consumption. Although there was found to be pretty good evidence for the heaviest drinkers, the people I was involved in treating for most of my career, that if they, if they do take alcohol holidays, uh, their, their risk, uh, particularly of developing liver disease, is less than if they're, if they're drinking every day. So the standard Scottish drinking pattern of getting your money, hit it hard for three days take a break for four days till your money comes in, then you have another three days hitting it heavily, uh, actually is, is perhaps rather better than the, uh, um, if Emanuele would forgive me, the Italian habit of uh, let's get a, a couple of bottles a day. But so that's for the heaviest drinkers. It does make some sense for them to take alcohol-free days. But for the broad population, there's not a great deal of evidence. In fact, there wasn't evidence at all that that reduces the risk. But, of course, having days when you're not drinking reduces your overall uh, weekly consumption. So that was how that guideline came out. Um, <coughs> and Hope mentioned earlier the business of... of of binge drinking or, or bout drinking, really, which I've just described. And the guideline did say things about that. And it said something very complicated. So this is, 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 is the total guideline on single episode drinking. And essentially, it was the, the point that Pia was making earlier that for some groups of the population, their risks from single drinking episodes are much higher than for others, and, and typically men is, is much higher than for women. So the guideline really came out, um, I'm sorry, with, uh, with this fairly you know, obvious uh, guideline at the, at the top about drinking more slowly and alternating with water and so on and so forth. But this issue here about the context of your drinking episode, avoiding risky places, making sure you're with your friends, getting home safely, were all found to have a significant impact on 
the, the risk of, of single drinking episodes. And it was interesting to me because in the United Kingdom, the, the, the advice on this kind of thing, you know, get home safely, have your friends, make sure they know who you are, has pretty all been aimed at women. So there's been pretty active public campaigns about get home safely, typically aimed at women and, and not really aimed at men. So I'm sure there's, there's something about the innate risk-taking behaviour of men. But I think also our, you know, harm reduction, safe drinking message thing has, has been, been aimed more at women than in, at men. And that may be a factor in women's risk being found to be, to be lower. Um, and uh, as you'll see, the, the, the rest of it is, is uh, just as I say, some, some, some general guidelines on the risks of, of intoxication for some particular groups. So the important thing about this was that the decision was made not to come out with a numerical indicator for single drinking episodes because there were too many other contextual things that, that, that came into to play. And that might be an interesting debate to have about whether that was the, the, the right decision or not. Um, <coughs> moving on to the um, pregnancy guideline, it came out um, advising if you're pregnant, planning a pregnancy, safest approach is not to drink at all. Uh, the more you drink, the, gr the greater, greater the risk. And, and a bit of kind of social norms here pointing out that um, you know, most women stop, stop drinking dur during, during pregnancy. Um, Previous to, to this guideline, the guidelines varied throughout the United Kingdom, and I'll come back to that. And, and, in, and in, in England, the, the um, guidance was, was, was to avoid drinking alcohol, but if, if pregnant women choose to drink, to minimise the risk of the baby, they should not drink more than one to two units uh, once or twice a week and should not get drunk. So that was the previous guideline, um, uh, but, but, but this guideline changed that to being best to, to avoid pregnancy. Um, in the United Kingdom, this planning of pregnancy is, is, is an important bit. About 50% of pregnancies in the United Kingdom are planned. And that actually seems to be a pretty universal figure. I, I know in the United States, where the Centre for Disease Control came out with, with, with similar guidance on pregnancy last year, they, 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 actually last month, they also estimated that about 50% of pregnancies are planned. I know in New Zealand, they have a similar figure. So I think this is quite an interesting issue, actually, about because the... You know, there are good reasons to think some of the risks of drinking in pregnancy are in the very early part of, 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 of gestation, uh, often before the pregnancy is recognised. Um, and the question of what we sh should then be, be doing about population consumption of women of childbearing age, I think, comes, comes into play. So um, it's nice to think that every pregnancy is carefully planned and, you know, written down in the diary and mother and father and can, you know, get the nursery painted and plan their health and so on. But uh, half, of pr half of pregnancies at least seem not to be like that. Um, and uh, so it, I, I think that remains a bit of a challenge. But so the pregnancy uh, guideline, I think, has been essentially simplified to, 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 to not, drinking, not drinking at all. <coughs> Piers mentioned some of this and the, the, their were a lot of background papers, all of which are available. I think these are the two key ones. The review from the Sheffield team using the Sheffield Alcohol Policy Model that's um, been used for, for various purposes in the UK. And the, the report from Liverpool John Moores University. So if you Google CMO alcohol guidelines, you come to a page with the guideline um, in various lengths. And in Welsh, if anybody wants to read the guideline in the Welsh language, you can do that. Uh, but it also has at the bottom supporting evidence that takes you to a, 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 a kind of Dropbox account where there's an awful lot of stuff. And I would, I found these two to be the most, the most useful. Um, and I, like Pia, I'll, I'll draw a bit on the, on the, on the, the Sheffield one. Um, the thing that, that has, I think, changed the nature of the UK guidelines has been the um, recognition of the of alcohol and cancer risks, and that has come out, particularly the breast cancer, from relatively recent, very large studies, particularly the the million women study, the nurses study in the in the in the US. Um, Scottish Health Action Alcohol Problems. My organisation produced a report in in. in uh, 2012, the Alcohol Health Alliance at UK followed us a year later, in 2013, um, and there, there have since been European uh, uh, publications drawing um, 
attention to the link between alcohol and cancer, and, and cancer organisations, the World Cancer Research Fund and others, uh, now have alcohol as a, as a significant uh, contributor to cancer in a way that they probably didn't. So this really has been a growing field and, and one that had a significant impact on the way that, that the guidelines uh, came out. Um, and for me, it's been interesting in that the, the recognition of the breast cancer, I think, has changed the perception uh, around about alcohol and cancer. Alco the links between alcohol and mouth cancer has b have been well known for many, many years, particularly a joint interaction between alcohol and smoking. Um, but mouth cancer is not... Uh, I'll just be direct about saying this. I apologise if I offend anyone. Mouth cancer is not a terribly fashionable cancer. It's not a cancer that gets a lot of public attention. It's not a cancer that generates a lot of... Um, charitable donations, neither is lung cancer, for instance, um, whereas breast cancer is different from that for, for a number of reasons that we could spend all day talking about. But, but breast cancer does attract a, a attention and concern in a way that some of these other cancers don't, and I, and I think that's, that's changed the dynamics of the, of the discussion somewhat. Um, <coughs> this is similar to some of the, the slides that Pia um, produced. So I'll, I'll just say a little bit about this because I think it partly answers uh, Anne Hope's question about, about drinking. So this is, this is uh, from the Sheffield uh, background report but was uh, imported into the, the, uh, the, 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 the full guideline. And just to point out a couple of things that they have attempted here to model the difference between, for instance, a man who's drinking 21 units a week and is doing that over seven days and a man who's doing that uh, on, on one day. Okay, so the difference between the daily drinkers and the, and the bout drinkers. And you'll see that in general the trend is that for people who, who, who drink all of their alcohol on, on a limited number of occasions, the risks become higher. So uh, that's, the, that's kind of the way that... That, that things drift. So I think that uh, that uh, I think answers part of of of, of Anne's, Anne's question. And you will see that for um, you know the the equivalent level of consumption, the risks of um, mortality are higher for women than they are for men. So a woman drinking 49 units a week uh, over you know, drink, drinking every day has a higher risk of mortality than a man who's drinking in the same kind of pattern. Um, but I think the other thing to draw attention to, and again, Pia had mentioned this, is that the, the proportionate increase for men who are for binge drinking men is greater than for binge drinking women, okay? So the woman who's drinking 49 units uh, all in one day, her mortality risk is substantial but actually not very much greater than if she's spreading that over seven days a week. Okay, so, so for, men, for men, concentrating their drinking is, is a more dangerous thing than for, than for women to do. So a little bit of a complicated message, but I hope that makes sense to you. And if not, uh, you can read it and think it over and, and, and ask about it in, 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 uh, in, in discussion. Okay. Moving on, again, I'm very grateful that, that this was covered in the, in, in the earlier talk, that the, the two different ways of, of, of looking at risk are at relative risk and the absolute risk. And again, this is the way that the numbers came out. If we look at the Canadian approach of uh, at what level of drinking uh, does, does your risk become the same as someone who does not, does not drink at all? Um, the group answered to Kit's question, the scientists do think that the J-shaped curve is real. Uh, they don't think it's as, 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 as substantial as, as they used to think it was, and I'll come on to, to explain the reasons for that. But the J-shaped the the curve is fundamental to, to, to the thinking in the UK guidelines here, and, and also for Canada. So these are the, the, the levels of consumption at which uh, the... the, the uh, mortality of drinkers becomes the same as the mortality of non-drinkers. And above these levels of consumption, the mortality exceeds that of, of, of non-drinkers. So that's the relative risk approach. And the absolute risk approach, as Pia said, is the levels of consumption at which your risk of death approach is, is, is at 1%. And 
these levels of, cons of consumption actually came out at something fairly similar, which is why they settled on, on, on 14. Okay, you've seen some of these before, but I'll, I'll, I, I just want to explain the significance of them. Um, again, from Sheffield's work, so they found that the risk of breast cancer is linear. Um, but that's not true for all conditions. An acute pancreatitis, for instance, um, uh, the risk really only starts to take off at very high levels of consumption. Uh, so the pancreas is a gland that, that uh, produces digestive enzymes. If you're eating in a Russian restaurant, as we were last night, uh, the pancreas is called the sweet bread. Where's a tail? I checked on this. So sweet, what we were eating last night is, is either the pancreas or the thymus. Um, there are some other organs that can be described as sweet bread, but I'm not going to explain all that. So uh, I should explain in our restaurant last night, we were, we were given this dish and nobody's quite sure what it was made out of, but uh, it appears to have been uh, the pancreas of the cow. Well, I hope it's the pancreas of the cow. Um, but uh, so the, the point that I'm making is that for some diseases like breast cancer, the risk is linear, and for others, it's, it's, a, it's a, a curved, curved relationship. Um, and again, Pia's shown these slides, and the only point I want to make is that for mortality and morbidity, the risk curves are of different shapes. So dying of liver disease, your risk curve looks like this. And for getting ill with liver disease, this is women, this is men, your risk curves um, look like this. So the risk curves vary with gender, and they vary whether we're talking about people becoming ill or people, becoming dying, or, or people dying. So there are again, as, as the point was made earlier, there are many, many considerations that need to be crunched and, 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 and put together here. Um, and hypertensive diseases, I must admit this is a surprise to me, the extent to which women's risk of hypertensive disease really starts to take off much more than men. So this is male risk of hypertension uh, and uh, this is, this is the, the female risk, risk relationship. So again, you, you, you saw about 15 graphs all put together and just drawing attention to some of them to make the point that the type of risk relationships are, are different for different conditions and they're different whether we're thinking of, uh, of, of death or of illness. Ischemic heart disease, which um, uh, has already been, been, been mentioned. So uh, you'll see for, for death, you'll, you'll, you'll see the, the, the J-shaped curve here for, for women and for, for men with women's risk uh, climbing at, at, at these higher levels of consumption more than, than male risk. Uh, and these are the, the heart disease uh, morbidity risks. So uh, the J-shaped curve is alive and well, but it's a little bit shallower than it used to be thought. Um, and why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, and this is some mortality trends from, 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 from Scotland, from uh, in 1975, ischemic heart disease was a big deal in Scotland and anything that brought down ischemic heart disease was pretty important. Uh, liver disease was, was, was not killing terribly many people in the mid-70s, so it's something that reduced risk of heart disease was very important for Scottish mortality in the 1970s. Liver disease wasn't that big a worry for, for, for people. Um, but if we move on to look at 2010, you'll see that these... Uh, rates of, of ischemic heart disease in the population, this is men, had considerably fallen uh, and liver disease was actually becoming a, a, a more important contributor to Scottish mortality. I'll just show you the same slide for women. So, something that reduces deaths from ischemic heart disease, in this case light drinking, was more important in the 1970s than it is in 2010 because heart disease is a less important population. Still accounts for a significant chunk of, of, of Scottish deaths, but not as many as it did. So that, that's an important factor in the, in the J-shaped curve. And again, this point was made that different populations will uh, have different risks of different diseases. So overall, this was the thinking on, on, on how to, to, to think of the protective effects. Firstly, the protective effects Tend, tend to be effective in older age groups, whereas the risk of acute harms, and remember we're talking about them being particularly true in men, uh, affect younger men. Okay, so uh, preventing the, uh, extending the life of a, of a 70 year old has less effect on population health overall than, uh, uh, than a man dying at, at 20, you know, a young man from Glasgow diving off a, 
hotel balcony in Portugal intoxicated, and we did a report on that last year, and there's about five of those deaths a year. Um, so those deaths lead to, lead to a lot of life years lost. Um, so the deaths, particularly acute deaths, tend to, be, tend to be young, and the protective effects in older age group. There's a selection bias that uh, the, in older age drinkers, the, 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 the drinkers, they may be a healthier population. As I was saying earlier, mortality from heart disease is falling. And the peak effects of the protective effects are, are, at, are at low levels of, of consumption. So that affected the way that the protective uh, health effects, mainly for ischemic heart disease, but also for, for uh, type 2 diabetes and for, um, for uh, throm uh, thrombosis type stroke. You know, the, the, those diseases were also taken into account. But ischemic heart disease is numerically the big one. Okay, so that's just a, a little bit on how the things were thought about. There was an option to have a considerably more complex message than the message that came out of, you know, both men and, and, and women would be to keep their drinking low risk should remain b below 14 units, 140 mLs a, a week. Um, there was an option to have a much more complex message that might have looked something like this, that, you know, for women drinking at two units a day, they're risk of breast cancer is increased by 16%. They're drinking five units a day, 40 grams a day is, is 40%. For cirrhosis of the liver, similarly looking at um, different, uh, you know, relative risks at different levels of consumption. So that might, th this would have been an alternative way to present the, the, the guidance to the public. And again, that might be a thing that we'd, we'd want to talk about. Um, the guideline did, did say something about units and the, the public, and this is what it said. Um, <coughs> there have been a couple of bits of work that found that awareness of the, of the kind of term of units was, was pretty high. Most people had heard of the notion of, of units as a way of comparing the strengths of different drinks. Um, however, the, the ability to measure and to count intake is, is poor, particularly with home drinking. Uh, and in Scotland, 75% of drinking is now done at home. 20 years ago, half of our drinking was done in pubs. Uh, 20 years later, it's, it's about a quarter. So there's been a big shift to home drinking in the United Kingdom, which has driven a, 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 certainly a lot of the policy things that doctors have been keen to see. So for home drinking, people are not terribly accurate at measuring, and they're particularly bad with, with wine. So beer and spirits... Um, people are, are better at roughly stating units and measuring the units, but for wine, they're, um, they, they're, they're not so good. Um, and people tend to think in terms of containers. Uh, so in other words, you know, glasses of wine or pints of beer or cans of beer um, than, uh, than MLs. So th those are the findings from uh, units in the public. So the awareness is, is, is pretty good, but the actual... Uh, implementation and, and, and people's knowledge of their own practical drinking, particularly for wine drinkers and particularly for home drinkers, is not so good. But they did say something about uh, RARA. Uh, what they said is that there's no, and, and this exercise we're involved in, there's no simple solution, no easy way to make drinks more standard in strength and size. If there's a better alternative to the UK unit, we have yet to hear about it. So you might think that's a typically chauvinist uh, British bulldog kind of statement. Uh, we're, we're aware of discussions in RARHA which may consider a possible standard EU-wide unit. Um, it's vital this work takes into account differing consumer practices and understandings across member states. So that, that's, that's, what, the, that's um, what the UK guideline said about units and, and standard measures. How was it received? Um, just one drink a day is too much. Have a Friday night cup of tea instead. Health chief, and this is the English chief medical officer, attacked over nanny state alcohol guide. So that was the Daily Mail. Uh, the Scottish press received it rather differently. Uh, the UK following Scotland's lead, that always goes down well in my country, um, on, on zero alcohol pregnancy advice. Um, so, and I was speaking to Emmanuel about this yesterday. Essentially, to cut a very long story short, the response to the guidelines in the newspapers split down political lines. Right-wing newspapers didn't like it, and left-wing newspapers liked it. And it's as simple as that. We could go on and on about that at, at, at some greater length, but, but that was pretty much how they were received. Um, David 
Spiegel Halter, who's well known, reasonably well known public figure and, on, on the, the professor of public risk understanding, wrote a fairly critical blog actually about the guidelines, um, uh, where he he said that. Um, and just, to, just to, to, to quote what he said, these guidelines define low risk drinking as giving a less than 1% chance of dying from alcohol-related condition. An hour of TV watching or a bacon sandwich a couple of times a week um, is more dangerous to your long-term health. He later kind of somewhat apologised for that statement to say he had taken other measures of, of the risks of sedentary behaviour and the risks of drinking processed meat and simplified them somewhat and so on. But this got quite a lot of press attention. Um, and he was also critical of the notion that there's a 1% risk of, 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 dry, of, of dying in a car accident. Uh, he, he says that the risk actually is much less than that in the UK, which does have fairly safe roads, so he, he may be right about that. It all seems to come down to what pleasure you get from moderate drinking. So this attracted quite a lot of attention. I think the guideline group are probably a bit annoyed with him because he was consulted during the guideline and said he thought it was good. And then later when it came out, he, he went public with, 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 with some of this. Um, but uh, so that was some of the criticism, and he, and he designed this this graph from the the um, the, the, the uh, shades of red slide I showed you earlier, showing you know roughly what the you know what the, the, the guideline means in terms of estimated lifetime risk. So that was the kind of scientific reception, um, and the. Uh, in terms of, of the drinks industry, the Portman Group said the guidelines mean that UK men are now being advised to drink significantly less than their European counterparts. Um, and I think it's a fairly you know, obvious reason for that. Men die of alcohol-related disease much more than women do. Uh, I'm pleased that my colleague Mark Robinson's here. I was going to put this slide up anyway, whether you're here or not. Mark's part of the team who produces that. But, you know, should we just accept that men die at twice the rate that women do? The sky's blue, the grass is green, and men die alcohol-related deaths. Or should we actually be, be, be seeing, you know, that men ought to be drinking less to bring the mortality rate down? And just to finish off on our reception, this chap uh, didn't like the guidelines and said we should all go to the pub at lunchtime. Uh, uh, he's a member of the European Parliament, though he's not very keen on the European Parliament, but he, he does accept his salary, I understand from them. Um, but, uh, so Nigel Farage says that we should all go out and drink at lunchtime in order to thumb our nose at the chief medical officers and their nanny state guidelines. So that's me. That's the end of the presentation on the, the UK guidelines. I hope that built a little bit on Pia's presentation uh, just to see how, how the, if you like, uh, you know, so the recipe was put together from the science and, and, and was, you know, created into this dish which is currently being consumed by the, the British population and to just give you some idea of how that's been received. Okay, thank you. Um, Alfred. Alfred Dole from the Austrian Public Health Institute. Um, and, um, well, there's a few things uh, that I first wanted to remark. Of course, uh, the issue is incredibly complicated, but we always talk of risks and causes, and most of it is associations. Uh, <coughs> death rates that you produced, I mean, if one uh, reason increases, the other one sinks, so it's a complicated thing, and I'm with uh, Pia, who says that we should use what we have uh, but there's two issues that I want to stress. One is, a question at least, one is the original guidelines you showed had an upper and a lower limit. Mm -hmm. And from my experience, the higher one are the one that makes sense for people who really drink much because that's what mm -hmm. impresses them. So in Austria, we use the original ones that Peter Anderson in a WHO report has popularized like 15 years ago as well. Mm -hmm. And we still think it's quite sensible because uh, heavy drinkers, and those are many, are not impressed by very low quantities. Uh, and the other thing, which I think is very important, and this relates to both presentations, uh, if I want to inform people, and I think that I'm a consumer, if I sit at home with friends uh, and drink alcohol, I want to know if there's a health risk, not if I will have an accident with the car if I'm not driving. So. Uh, accident risks and health <coughs> risks are very different. And then there's, of course, associations. I mean, I'm not impressed if somebody tells me that people wearing a black pullover eat their wives twice as many as people who have no black pullover uh, because my wife wouldn't allow me to beat her up. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, just a couple of comments on that about the heaviest drinkers. I spent, you know, much of my professional life working with the heaviest drinkers, and uh, I, I do think there's a value in, or, in orientating them. I, you know, remember when the guidelines, you know, when the, the UK guideline was 21 units a week, 210 units a week. One of my patients said to me, "There's a mistake here. It should be 20. It should be." You know, 10 pints of beer a day, isn't it? That's what you mean. And I said, no, no, Albert, his name is Albert, 10 pints of beer a week. And he said, I don't know anybody who drinks like that. And really brought home to me the way that the heaviest drinkers drink with other heavy drinkers and all sit around reassuring each other that they're, they're normal. So I do think there is a need to orientate some heavier drinkers who, who want to, to, to hear the message. Many of them don't, of course, and want to tune out. Um, your argument that we should kind of meet them halfway and have a higher guideline that doesn't upset them too much... Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I, I, I think that, as I, say, the, the, as I was saying earlier, the UK guideline has been pitched at a 1% risk. Uh, but pe some people may be willing to accept a, a higher risk than that, and that's their, that's, that's, that's their choice, really. Uh, the issue of long-term health harms compared to acute health harms, I think um, the, the, one of the things about the, the current UK guidelines, and this is the first revision for 20 years, you need to remember that. You know, the previous guidelines were 1995. Um, the, the issue of acute harms has, 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 was a bigger consideration in these guidelines than it was in the previous ones, which were really, I think, based on the risk of cirrhosis, of, of, of long-term health harms, particularly liver disease. Um, in my country, I think that focus on acute harms is very important. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, although it might seem a, a relatively small issue, the issue of what are called balcony deaths uh, of, of young Scottish holidaymakers going to Portugal, Spain, Greece, whatever, and getting drunk and doing stupid things. Uh, and there's a reason, substantial number of deaths that happen every year from that. And they're reported in the newspapers as tragic accident, you know, and they'll have a picture of the guy picking his suitcase about to go off on his holiday. It's described as a tragic accident. It's not typically described as an alcohol-related <laughs> death, although it is. Uh, so I, th I think in, in, in my country, there's actually a need to say that these accidents are not inevitable, you know, that they, they, are, they are preventable and they're alcohol-related. So I think the focus on acute harms, has, particularly for young men, has been an important one. I think we need to move away from the kind of boys will be boys and they'll do daft things. There's some truth in that, but um, a, a, a lot of beer in your belly doesn't help, and we, we do have some significant amounts of young lives lost because of that. Thank you, Peter. Should we move to the next presentation? <clears throat>